You know, we, a few years ago, we made a trip down to the Southern Islands, and we saw fit to write a book, which was issued last September by Rand McNally in Chicago, entitled Upside Down and Right Side Up with B.J. Because when you're below the equator, you're upside down. And when you're upside down below the equator, you're right side up. It also wrote up the story, the best story that was ever written on the lost cities of Angkor Kham in old Cambodia. The book is 1,048 pages with 530 pictures. It was issued last September. The book cost us $16,000. It is not yet entirely paid for. Now, I would like everyone who will tomorrow purchase a copy of that book, please stand. <laughs> of that bump, produce deafness, reduction of that bump should restore hearing. Fortunately, that bump was reduced, and fortunately, hearing was restored. That incident started and established a truth, heretofore unknown and unused. I ask you, would the average man upon a single isolated case have discovered a universal human principle and practice. Was that man justified in laying down an all-complete, all-inclusive, and all-exclusive universal human principle? Fifty-eight years has justified that conclusion. Chiropractic is based upon the fixed, fixed uh, facts of physics that matter cannot move without force or energy. That human matter is in motion as human energy gets to that matter. That human matter moves in speed, in exact ratio as the quantity of human energy predetermines as delivered to that human matter. More mind in more matter equals more motion. Now matter moves as it's moved upon by energy. Moving composite beings are alive. Inanimate composite beings are dead. To move is to live. Motion is life. To not move is to be dead and no motion is death. A necessity for motion and to be unable to control motion is dis-ease. Matter cannot move without energy to move it. So the quality of living 
is an element entirely within the knowledge and province of innate intelligence resident within us. Matter moves at a normal rate of speed when that is well. When it does, matter lives and is healthy. Reduce the speed by reducing the quality of energy that moves it, and you reduce the quantity and quality of production of its product and its byproducts. And it is as simple as that. Life or living matter or matter action at normal rate of speed is because of a continuity flow of energy through a continuity of matter. Break the continuity of matter or the continuity of energy and you break the continuity of action with its consequent reduction in product and byproducts. Cut a nerve in two, by intention or through an accident. Somewhere between the brain and the end of that nerve in the body, and you have broken the continuity of the medium, which carries the continuity of energy flow. If the nerve is in natural continuity, as it was intended to be in human beings, between brain and the end of that nerve in the body, then the continuity of energy flow is normal and the individual will be well unless it's broken. The constant which comprises the scientific fundamental upon which chiropractic rest is an accident of some kind, one of many kinds, introduces the external concussion of force which when it meets resistance with the body and contacts produces a concussion of forces. One invasionary, the other resisting, which because of the clash and concussion of forces betwixt and between, being the vertebral column, subluxates a vertebra of the spinal column, which in turn produces an occlusion and a pressure and an interference to flow and creates dis-ease. The chiropractic practice is to locate the exact vertebral subluxation and ascertain its precise abnormal position, then by hand only, efficiently give it an adjustment to correct its malposition, which opens the occlusion releases the pressure, restores the transmission, and given time, produces health. And it is as simple as that. All energy for all the body is resident in all the brain. Each part of the brain produces all the energy for that part of the body. Cut off all they do that normal quantity of brain energy from going to some part of the body and it reduces its tissue speed, reducing its working product or byproducts and the individual becomes sick. And if entirely cut off, would be dead. The brain is the life source. The spinal nerves and spinal cord merely convey or transmit that life force to all parts of the body. The human brain is a human dynamo. The human body is a series of human motors. The human nervous system is a series of transmitters of human energy, both efferent and afferent, completing circuits, generating, conveying, and acting human electricity. Each nerve circuit, brain to body and body back to brain, is independent in brain production, nerve transmission, and tissue cell speed of action, yet simultaneously dependent from all others as all others are dependent upon it. But this human innate mind is a great intellectual director, regulator, or controller of human energy. For mind is a thought force. If the brain generates the thought force, 
The nerves convey thought energy. The body expresses that mental function. The body will be healthy in all parts. If the normal quantity of mental impulses get through from brain to all parts of the body. So you see how easy and simple the whole problem is. A vertebral subluxation can be aptly compared to a dam. The vertebral subluxation squeezes the opening through which nerves pass. The reduced size of this opening produces a pinching or pressure upon nerves. Build a dam across the river and it produces similar conditions. The dam backs up water behind the dam. This keeps water from going through and getting below the dam. The vertebral subluxation acts as a dam on the nerves or spinal cord. This stops the blow forward and backs it up behind. This damming back of human nerve force produces a stuffy, full congestion feeling behind the obstruction in the head. It also keeps nerve force current from flowing forward below the obstruction, starving the territory below, which would be otherwise fed by that nerve force flow. When a dam gate is opened, the water is permitted to flow through, and when an adjustment is given to the vertebral subluxation, the nerve force flow is permitted to flow freely to the places above or the places below. And this receives, relieves the congestion above and feeds the starved area below the dam. And health is thus re-established. Getting sick people well is as simple as that. Now, kind of like having a right formula for getting sick people well, does get sick people well. If chiropractic was wrong, it would fail to get sick people well. Chiropractic being right, it is applicable in 100% of cases. If it was wrong, it would apply in no case. The chiropractic principle and practice being fundamentally sound, then it is right all the way. Vital and fundamental principles have a definite fixed approach and application which are not subject to the caprices and idiosyncrasies of men. If they were, chaos in all fundamentals would exist. In this category are found all sciences. It is that stability which makes it a science. Two times two makes four. Not sometimes, but always. Universally so. This regulatory factor is not a matter of individual opinion in which one may make it six and another make it eight. It is always four, no matter who, why, where, or how. It is this fixed rule of mathematics which makes it a science. Chemistry and astronomy are two more having fixed principles and practices. It is that ability to agree on fundamentals that makes science. It is that inability to agree on fundamentals that draws the sharp line between scientists and theorists, realists and sophists. If everyone who called himself a mathematician, a chemist, or astronomer had personal reasons for rules of his own, there could and would be no scientific value to any common fundamental on which they could or would agree. Sciences are based on fixed formulae, but the only reason they are is because they work. Chiropractic has a scientific fixed success formula that works when it's worked. I recall some years ago, we were coming from the South Pacific Islands. We stopped at the Tin Can Island of Nianfu, 
because that was the one place in the world where there was a, an eclipse of the sun that day. And all the astronomers of the world had gathered in the end to, to photograph that eclipse of the sun. Coming home on the boat were many astronomers. And I said to the astronomer from the Department of Astronomy of the University of West Virginia, one night we were sitting out on the deck, I said, Professor, tell me, how near did your various astronomers that was gathered from all the world, Siberia, Russia, Norway, Sweden, uh, Denmark, Belgium, France, Germany, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, China, how near did you agree as to when that eclipse will begin and when it will end? He said, we all agreed to the second of coming and going with the exception of one man. Well, I said, how much was he off? He was off one half a second. That's what makes astronomy a science. It is this ability to lay aside the differences of views, agree on fundamentals, hold the differences of opinions on everything else, which enables scientists to find factual data and then agree. Somewhere between the law of facts of living beings wandering through the maze of the failures of the practice of medicine, there is a law to life to which and through which all the so-called phenomena of life and death, sickness and health apply. There is a health success formula that works somewhere. Time, place and individual opinions do not change the fact. They only mislead one in searching for the right formula. When that chiropractic success formula is used, medical mysteries disappear and common sense will be understood. Instead of a very fertile sick field being under intensive health cultivation, producing bumper crops of healthy people, there exists a medical jungle of undergrowth of weeds, impenetrable and impossible, with many sowing wild weeds to make it worse. Each science has its law for which no man who professes to be an advocate and a follower can escape. His beginning, his boundaries, his circumscribed path are defined and confined by it. No man can work against law and expect law to work with him. That is the law of law. Where is the medical man who, with all his medical education, could artificially make and direct the function of one tissue cell? Yet the innate intelligence, living, directing, and regulating all the tissue cells and functions in the mother, built entire baby bodies. That is the wisdom the chiropractor prefers to permit to get sick people well. This reasoning is equally true in man. His conception, gestation, development, birth, life, death, health, sickness, and restoration back to health. It was and is governed by law. It has been governed by law for millions of years in millions of bodies. It is governed by law now in millions of people. To know that law and to work with that law is to know how they get sick people out. Well. That law is simple, in principle and practice. As two times two makes four, not sometimes, but always. A chiropractor knows that law and works with it. That's why get sick people get well. And it is as simple as that. Chiropractic has discovered and developed knowledge of that law that has always existed and fills the great void for that law in the application to man and his sickness. Chiropractic destroys nothing, replaces nothing, substitutes nothing, 
Neither is it iconoclastic against any present-day satisfactory order of things in conformity with our law. Chiropractic is an original and new principle in practice, as compared with all others in its field of effort, and was born of a necessity to make possible a long sought for hitherto impossibility. The automobile did not replace the horse, even though both were transportation methods. The electric light did not substitute kerosene, even though both sought light. Neither does chiropractic substitute medicine, though both desire health to the sick. Each in its turn and place incorporated a new principle, a new practice, and a new result. Chiropractic has fundamental postulates of science as constants for scientific, logical procedure, possesses essential processes to base its science on. Therefore, it meets the exacting demands of proving itself in terms of science. Chiropractic fundamentally does get sick people well because it has well-defined, well-identified, scientific principles, step by step in sequence, from health to dis-ease, and from dis-ease back to health. Hence, chiropractic locates and corrects a true specific of cause and cure of disease. Chiropractic, like all sciences, always works and does attain the same ends of any science when scientists work with it, apply the correct rules which established it as a science. Chiropractic is natural, created before man, not by man. Chiropractic is as powerful as any other power contained within and liberated by law, or by any other natural power, or anything natural. It has nothing artificial in its makeup. It is reason and logic within every bond of logic and reason. In the abstract, it is broad enough to cover the entire human race and limited enough to apply to one person. Its very appeal to human understanding lies in its dynamic simplicity. Medicine to the average individual is a mysterious principle in practice. It too can be reduced to a simple formula. Weaving through the multiplicity of diagnostic names and prescriptions, it boils down to two diseases. To rapid action for one type, to slow action for the other. And then, that's why you find so many hyper and hypo prefixes to their names, for which it has two kinds of drug treatments to inhibit the stimulation, to stimulate the inhibition. In other words, hypo the hyper and hyper the hypo. Two general kinds of drugs to treat two general kinds of diseases. A good example that comes to comes readily is the heart and its action. If it beats approximately 72 times a minute, we have normal pumping action and the heart health exists. If it beats 85 times a minute, it is not pumping too fast, and a heart disease, diagnosed as tachycardia, exists. For this, the physician would give some drug which would inhibit the rapid action. What kind of drug? or how much to give, might be difficult for him to decide. If it beats 60 times a minute, it is now pumping too slowly. And an opposite type of heart disease, diagnosed as bradycardia, exists. For this, the physician will give some drug which would stimulate the slowed action. What kind of drug, or how much to give, 
still might be difficult for him to decide. So he tries this or that until he thinks he knows. The chiropractor does not work with that principle. He adjusts and permits a restoration of the normal quantity of its internal innate flow of force. Physicians have a medical concept that the body lives within itself when it's healthy. But when sick, it needs some external agency to give it health. So they prescribe chemicals, antis, and other neutralizing agencies under stimulative or inhibitive or neutralizing processes to make it well. They work on the principle of asserting they know what the unbalance is. Then by stimulation or inhibition, force it either up or down, arbitrarily and empirically, to a standard which they think they know. If it goes too high, they bring it down. If it goes too low, they force it up. The chiropractor does not know that normal power. Only the resident intelligent force within us does know. So, we leave all of that to it. It is as simple as that. When drugs are given, it is with the assumption that the physician knows what is wrong, his diagnosis is infallible, the physician knows the exact phaser chemical formula, therefore knows the exact correct chemical formula to give. If it is a stimulated condition, he knows exactly how much of an inhibitor to give the balance. If it's an inhibited condition, he knows exactly how much of a stimulant to give the balance. He knows what the balance is, or should be, without possibility of error. When he gives a drug by way of the stomach, the stomach knows just where the physician wants it to send it, and sends it there without deviation or deflection. For instance, if it were rheumatism in the right big toe, the stomach would not send it to the left big toe. The chiropractor presumes no such understanding. He adjusts at the location of the interference. This is all he can do. The brain generates the right quantity of force in health and sickness. The nerves now convey that right quantity of thought force to the periphery. Wherever those nerves go, where the dis-ease is, to the place or places where it should go. When the normal quantity arrives, it knows exactly what to do and how to do it to produce the right quantity and quality of life. All the things I don't know, it does. That is intellectually, internally controlled and is at all times beyond my reach in either sickness, health, life, or death. And I couldn't control it if I wanted to. And I couldn't control it no matter how much education I did or did not have. You do not control the quantity of electricity when you turn on the button, or tell the electricity where to go, or tell the electricity when to go, Neither do you stimulate or inhibit the wires or globe or their excess or minus quantities. It goes when you turn on the button. When it arrives, it gives you life. Some men doubt and even deny the existence of a vital life force. And then they run into trouble. So you see how simple it is. Now, people have been taught that germs cause disease. That isn't true. You can vaccinate an entire community and make them sick to keep one person that is sick from getting well. Simple, isn't it? The cause of disease is not a communistic thing. And I don't mean that in a political sense. This idea that the community makes a person sick or we've got to do something to the community to get the one sick person well is wrong. 
The cause of disease is not in the community. The cure of disease is not in the community. The cause is individualistic. And the cure is individualistic within the individual. So you see how simple it is? After all, no government can long survive when the individual and his responsibility are ignored and all his responsibility shed upon the community. No government arrives anywhere until the individual has been taught to assume his responsibility, after which the community action is automatic, wherein the many are made up out of the one. All experience that survives in the cause and cure of disease is based upon a knowledge that the cause and cure of disease is within the individual. And this is not a responsibility that he can set upon his neighbor and blame him for it. But any health method ignores the individual in its equation and casts that blame upon the community. He professes his ignorance of the cause and cure of disease as it exists in the individual and thus proves his incompetence to be of service to an individual, except as he tries to reach him through community welfare. The cause of smallpox is in the individual, not the community. The cure of smallpox lies in the individual, not in wholesale vaccination of the community. Physicians admit that some people are immune, others are fertile culture grounds. Some resist better than others. Those who resist are stronger and are more able to cast off. And you ask any physician, why of a thousand people, five are down with smallpox? They'll say the 995 are able to resist the invasion. What makes resistance? It's that internal power that flows from within that builds up the resistance to the invasion of anything. Then why blame the community and vaccinate them all? An individual with a subluxation will resist less and one without will resist more. Resistance from within is fundamental. With it we resist and without it we invite invasion. All schools of health are agreed upon this principle as sound. Germs exist. We don't deny their presence. We deny them as a cause of disease. I think it's safe to say that if throat swabs were made of everybody in this room tonight, you'd find that the most of you have tuberculotic germs, you have typhoid germs, you have malarial germs, you have smallpox germs, and you have several kinds of germs in your body right now. But are you sick? No, because your body can resist them. Germs are scavengers. They help to keep the alleyways of the sick body clean. They eat it up. The same as we send rats out to eat our garbage. The rats don't cause the garbage to be there. It's the balance of nature in keeping up the balance between scavenger matter and scavengers. You see, when the chiropractor affirms this principle of the necessity of internal resistance in the individual, and then he practices that by making the internal resistance naturally possible in the individual, flowing from within, he confirms his consistency in principle and practice. I don't, I recall, as I told you the other day on this great surgeon who came, I don't think we ever convinced him in any way, but look what it did to his wife. Now as a practical observer, watching the efforts of medical men, this part brings back to my mind, just flashes through. Some years ago, I was to lecture in Portland, Oregon. And I had been reading several medical books and it talked all about the phenomena of medicine, which called to my mind that some years before that I had been down in Kentucky. And I saw a great big fat Negro sitting on a split rail fence. And I said, Sam, it seems to me 
And with this fertile soil you have here, you want to raise a good crop. Did you? And I said, it seems to me with this sun beating down, we ought to raise a fine crop. Yep. Well, it seems to me if you had a little rain, you could wear, build some fine crops here. Yep. I said, it seems to me that with a little energy, you could do a lot of things here. And he said, yep. Well, I said, what are you waiting for? He said, I'm just waiting for that little energy. So it, some years ago, as I say, I was reading some books on this phenomenon of faith, the phenomena of medicine, the phenomena of this. And incidentally, there isn't a doctor, a physician, or a surgeon alive that can tell you in advance the effect of any one drug on any one person. There is no specific in medicine. Why? Because the imponderables of the human individual makes the prescribing of a drug an imponderable in its result. Yet many possesses no imponderabilities. The image is a fixed law, and all this works. I was making this trip out to Portland. I was reading medical books about this phenomenal thing, and I was discouraged. So I went out on the highway and I walked down the road. And I saw a horseshoe. I stooped down, picked it up. And I said, gee, now I'm going to get good luck. Found a horseshoe. Went along a little further. I found another horseshoe. And I said, now I'm going to get double good luck. Went along a little further. I saw another horseshoe. So I picked it up and I said, now triple good luck's coming my way. I turned around and started towards town, and I come across a whole pile of horseshoes. Then I realized there's a question of junk. And I think the same thing is true with physicians. You get one physician, one diagnosis. You get two physicians, two diagnoses, two horseshoes. You get third physician in a conference, and then you've got three horses. By the time you get four of them, you've got junk for the undertaker. <laughs> the medical profession seek aim and The medical profession seek aim and death like murderers in every dark crevice and crack and corner in your body. In the air, the wool, the water, the food, even inside the man. And so they fluorinate the water to kill the germs to keep you well. Where the health comes from within. That's why we have well water here. Everywhere. Everywhere are multitudinous microbes, some so small that even an electron microscope magnifying a hundred thousand times can't find them. These natural products, as natural as man himself, conceived and created by any, designed by any, to fill all natural functions are exhibited by man alone as horrible examples of mistakes of in it. I wonder how those people figure out that God actually made the world. Now, you see, he made all these devils to decimate man. And yet he's been doing a pretty good job of it for millions of years. I don't see how they can confuse the two ideas. I couldn't. And I don't see how they can, in this endless struggle. And I don't see how they can, in this endless struggle. How the ordinary sick person starts out as an acute case. Yesterday he had next. And today he's got a little fever. Mother gets a little anxious and worries, and so she calls the doctor. The doctor said, I don't know what to call this yet because 
I'll have to wait until it develops. So he hangs around for four or five days and the temperature keeps going up, gets up to 102.6. And he said, I don't know quite yet. We'll wait and see if there's a breaking out. Then it breaks out and now he said we have an eruptive fever. We uh, think that it may be virulent, it might be scarlet fever, it might be measles. We'll wait a few days. Meanwhile, you just give the child this and this and this. And eventually, someday, the case goes from the acute stage into the chronic stage. Maybe they're dead. Maybe they're crippled. Maybe they're this, that, and the other thing. I recall, I think I told the pre lyceum class last year that at one time we had quite a number of polio cases in our student clinic. And the health officer of the city of Davenport came up and he said, Now, BJ, you've got to report all these because we passed an ordinance. The said, we've got to report these cases so we can quarantine them. And I said, John, tell me, John Mullen was his name. I said, John, tell me, what are the symptoms of the pathologies of polio? Well, he said, we don't know. That's why we're quarantining them so we can find out. <laughs> and I said, all right, John, when you know what polio is and can come and tell me, then I'll know what polio is then I'll know what to report to you so that you can quarantine them. And that was the end of that. They never quarantined any of our cases because I didn't know what to report to them for quarantine. A little common sense knocks down a lot of scientific nonsense. And I knocked it in the cock hat. That was that. You know what a specialist is? He's a man who knows more and more about less and less. He spends a lifetime on the eye, the ear, the nose, the throat, the heart, the stomach, or what have you. And then what? He's forgotten that the eye, the ear, the nose, the throat, the heart, or the stomach is a part of the rest of the body. So he becomes a specialist on that one thing. After all, it is on top of all parts of that body and knows that no one part can live onto itself. They've got to coordinate themselves and it knows how to coordinate. So you see, after all, it's just as simple as that. Now the kind of factor changes this whole picture. Instead of sickness and recovered health being a highly specialized and complex subject, which only a few university graduates understand only a mere small part of, it now becomes a simple subject, in fact so simple that any man on the street can have it explained and understand, knows what to do, where to go to get well. It is so simple that the students of this school can't understand it. Eighty percent of our time is spent for telling those students why germs don't cause disease. And twenty percent trying to pump something in about a verbal subluxation and an interference to innate. Eighty percent backing up what his grandmother and great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother or grandfather has been pumping into him for centuries. And we've only got four little insignificant years to unbreed the breedings of centuries. I can't see why he can't see the obvious, but they rarely do. You see the very successful objections deny us the things, and yet, he keeps pumping it back to us all the time. I've had it right here in last week's work. I'll have it in some of my questions tomorrow. I'll bet you a dollar against every person in this house. And tomorrow, I get some damn fool questions about what I've been talking about all week. But just 
must remember that the transition from the old order of things to the new order of things is a question of growth. And growth is a question of time. I was talking to a certain Colonel Prector who was in the tent tonight, and that person asked me a certain question. Now that person is a very fine Colonel Prector. And yet, there was one phase of this whole subject that wasn't known to that Colonel Prector until last week. And the talk that I gave Sunday morning, that person came to me and said, BJ, now I have grown one step further. You see, it takes time. And time is the great factor. The people didn't buy Henry Ford's car, the first one he produced. They laughed at him, scoffed at him. They said, have a team hitch up the livery stable and get ready because he may call for you. How do I know? I had the first gasoline automobile west of the Mississippi. And I know once in a while we had to call on a team, too. <laughs> they wasn't perfected yet. But how people used to laugh. I mean, I was so afraid that the people wouldn't know who owned the car that I put my name on the side, on both sides of it. <laughs> That was the day of a horseless carriage. And I know when the farmers came to town with their eggs and chickens, once in a while a team would run away. You'd see chickens all over the streets and eggs spilled all over the streets and broken. Then they sued me for damages. My defense was if you had a good harness on the horses, you would have held them so they wouldn't have run away. And I always got out of it. So I know what it means to be a pioneer. I recall when we were first starting it with radio, some 36 years ago with WOC, I went to the banker. I said, Mr. Banker, what do you think about this radio thing? Look at me and said, BJ, it's a plaything. It's a plaything for kids. The fool is money is too part. Don't waste any money on it. Then I went to the editor of a newspaper. Put the same question to him. He said, BJ, a fool needs money soon. Pardon me, it's kids play thing. Don't waste any money on it. You know, about five years ago, I was offered $200,000 for WHO. I went down to the banker. And I said, what do you think? Here's a letter from the National Broadcasting Company offering me $200,000 for WHO. And he said, BJ, by all means, take it. That's $200,000 in the bank. Take it. <laughs> Less than one year later, I had a, another letter from the National Broadcasting Company asking me to sell at the beginning price of $2 million. The beginning price, from that up to whatever we'd ask for. I took that letter down to him. He put his hands up, sort of shading and hiding his nose, and he said, well, we can all make mistakes. I know what it means to be a pioneer, and I know how people laugh at us. But somehow it didn't stop me. 36 years ago, I laid down this principle. This is a community station owned by the community for community service. That has been always our watchword in the use of that station. And we've never missed fire with it. At the same time, 36 years ago I said, the day will come when we will bring the world to your ears. We will bring the world to your eyes and we'll bring it in color, 36 years ago. We've been bringing it to the ears for 36 years. We're now bringing it to the eyes the last five years with WOC. And now we're broadcasting color. So after all, where was the vision? It takes guts 
intestinal fortitude to have a vision and stand by it until it comes through. We sent $440,000 in WOC before we were able to get our first commercial dollar back from it. But oh boy, we've got it back since. The chiropractic principle is simple. The practice is simple. The results for the sick are simple. Providing a success formula is correctly and efficiently followed. You know something? I'm an ignoramus. I suddenly was graduated from the high school the first half of the first year. Will Logie that run a chain of drug stores and Will Hickey that runs a chain of cigar stores and myself, we took some live rats to school in cigar boxes. In the study room where there's about 400 students, about a half of them girls. And we turned them loose, the rats. And the girls jumped up on the desk and pulled their skirts up. Well, that's why we did it. Wings all fire, expel. I never went back. So I'm an idiot man. What do I know about chemistry? All I know is H2O means water, and I don't know that. I just think that's so. Maybe it is, maybe it ain't. What do I know about bacteriology and microscopy? Nothing. What do I know about a lot of this junk that we're compelled to teach here? in order to go around and prove to the world that we're highbrows. I don't know those things, and yet you super intelligent people come here and listen to an ignoramus talk. All I know subluxation that makes sick people well and I know how to correct it. That's all I need to know. From then on, everything else that we want done or hope to have done, either from the patient's point of view or ours, is up to innate, and that's in the individual and not in me. I recall some years ago, I went to Beamington, West Virginia, Opened an office upstairs in the outfellows hall. All I had, all I had, was a suitcase adjusting cable. I had nothing else. But within my mind, I was a disciple of my father. My father said, the cause of all disease lies in the backbone. And being a good St. John or St. Peter, I believed it. And I went out on the highways and the byways and began punching backbones, ignorant little kid of 18. And I was getting sick people well. Why did I succeed? I was making 200 hours a day. Kid 18. Ignorant. All I had was a head and hands and a little table. But rattling around in that head was an idea. And that idea was propounded by my father as I sat at his feet night after night and listened to him say, it works. And I went out with that idea. And I've never gotten away from that idea one minute, one thought from that day to this very hour.